Hello, everyone. With today's scripture, we're into the home stretch of Paul's letter to the Philippians, a letter that reminds us that when the evil one seems loud, Jesus is on the throne. That makes him king, and we're citizens of his kingdom. Paul tells us about this in chapter 3, starting with verse 17. Let's listen to God's word. So, my dear family, I want you all together to watch what I do and copy me. You've got us as a pattern of behavior. Pay careful attention to people who follow it. You see, there are several people who behave as enemies of the cross of the Messiah. I told you about them often enough, and now I'm weeping as I say it again. They are on the road to destruction. They worship their stomachs and find glory in their own shame. All they ever think about is what's on the earth. We are citizens of heaven, you see, and we're eagerly waiting for the Savior, the Lord Christ Jesus, who is going to come from there. Our present body is a shabby old thing, but he's going to transform it so that it's just like his glorious body. And he's going to do this by the power which makes him able to bring everything into line under his authority. Well then, my dear family, I miss you so much. You're my joy and crown. This is how you must stand firm in the Lord, my beloved people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was 16, my family moved to Indonesia. It was a huge adventure, and I'm very glad for that experience, but something was missing. And it came to me when I was standing on the beach at night during a youth retreat. My hometown band was Journey, and someone played their song, Don't Stop Believing. Well, that's when it hit me. I missed being home. And that's how it is with living abroad. Nothing feels like home. Everything from the language, the food, the smells, signs, crowds, you know, things like black-colored toothpaste and drinks that we call green stuff, it's all there reminding us that we are not from this place. And that's how it is with the citizenship. It shapes who we are, and we usually don't realize just how much that's the case until we've been away for a while. It's true even for those who become citizens of this country through our convoluted naturalization process. People like Aso Tavishian, a Bulgarian-born man who created one of the earliest software companies in the U.S. A few years ago, he said this, the philanthropic culture of our country leading to the sense of satisfaction and having a positive effect on the lives of others is another great characteristic of the United States. I consider myself very fortunate to be a citizen of the United States. Thank you, Mr. Tavishian, and every other person who endured time, ordeal, and in some cases fought our wars to become U.S. citizens. Their pride is an honorable voice in a day where dishonor seems to run amok. And that's how it was for Paul as a Roman citizen, too. Like U.S. citizenship is today, Roman citizenship was the big prize, and some paid a lot of money to get at it, but, but Paul was born into it. You know, check this out in Acts 22. When Paul was being threatened and he needed some help, the tribune came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, yes. Well, the tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Paul said that I am a citizen by birth. You know, three centuries after Paul, Romans still took great pride in their national identity, as this verse from the poet Claudian captured. Rome, Rome alone, has found the spell to charm the tribes that fell beneath her conquering arm, has given one name to the whole human race, and clasped and sheltered them in fond embrace. But as proud as people were to be Roman citizens, and that includes Paul, he doesn't even hint at his earthly citizenship in Philippians. For him, there's an identity that runs deeper. 
an identity bought for him by the blood of Christ Jesus. We are citizens of heaven. And like a sponge soaks in water, Paul let his kingdom identity shape him. And it seeps out of this letter everywhere. He's written from a shame-shaped place where death stench filled his nostrils. And he could be next. Yet his thankful spirit sings the song of the psalmist. All of your works will thank you, Lord, and your faithful followers will praise you. And like a stone sends ripples across a still pond, Psalm 145, which we just read from, echoes throughout this letter. Paul's written that when he has no control over life, yet his words exude confidence in God. It's just like David saying, the Lord always keeps his promises. He is gracious in all he does. Paul was part of a persecuted minority, imprisoned for no good reason, but that didn't diminish his knowing that God is finishing his work. Just like David saying, the Lord is righteous in everything he does. And Paul has every reason to grumble and accuse, be angry and try to get even. But his song sings, his heart sings the God song that David composed. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to angry, and filled with unfailing love. He's isolated and alone, yet he knows that with God and his word close, that, that's enough. Because just as David sang, the Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. And though he has every reason to curse God over his troubles, he exalts his precious Savior as the name above every name. Just as David sang glory to God in the psalm, I will praise the Lord and and may everyone on earth bless his holy name forever and ever. You see, this is what citizens of heaven do. When everything in us wants to curse, we bless Now, we won't get it right all the time because just like Paul admitted, he hadn't reached perfection, but he pressed on. And as he did, Paul discovered the truth of God's perpetual song. Your faithful followers will speak of the glory of your kingdom. They will give examples of your power. They will tell about your mighty deeds and about the majesty and glory of your reign. And this is the time of God's reign. And our voices join a myriad of others singing his song. Jesus sang the first verse. The time promised by God has come at last. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Paul added his verses and we're adding ours. One verse building on the other, but always reflecting God's eternal glory. And for anyone who has the ears to hear, for the past few months, we've had a rich opportunity to show, to show just how real, vibrant, triumphant, and glorious God's kingdom is. We've, we've had an opportunity to rejoice when everyone around us is grumbling We've had an opportunity to serve Jesus and be church outside the walls of a building when Satan tried to shut us down. But we know his voice isn't the final one that sings. So what does this look like for us? I mean, the Philippians had Paul as a model, like he wrote, watch what I do and copy me. But we don't have Paul. And I certainly would never claim to have that kind of influence. God has blessed each generation with models. One of mine has been John Ortberg. Three weeks ago, he bid farewell to the congregation that he served for 17 years. John is one of ECO's go-to voices. His sermon helped launch our movement. And until August 2nd, he was lead pastor for one of ECO's anchor churches. But circumstances around his adult children had become difficult, both for himself and the church. And since the mission God has given the church is bigger than any one leader, John stepped aside. 
And sadly, you know, because of COVID-19, his last sermon was for an online-only audience. But despite the circumstances and the way it all came down, John turned his farewell into blessing. Rather than focusing on himself or the circumstances, he spoke about Jesus. He celebrated the opportunity that that church had given him to proclaim God's word and Jesus' lordship for 17 years with the world watching. And rather than say goodbye, he said, God bless you. And as I listened to John's farewell sermon, it struck me. He's done exactly what Paul has done in Philippians. Despite all the circumstances and pain, as a citizen of heaven, rather than curse, John blessed. Rather than grumble, he thanked. Rather than making it all about himself, he used his words to tell about Jesus. He sang God's song. And church, let, let's add our own choruses to this perpetual song. As citizens of heaven, when, when people burn Bibles in the streets, let's sing God's song of triumph. When everyone around us is tearing each other down, let's sing God's song that proclaims unity and peace. When people are hurting and feeling the sting of injustice, rather than get defensive or say, well, that's someone else's problem in doing, let's risk singing God's song that sows seeds of compassion. When schools are online and we hear that 4,000 children in this county fell off the radar, let's sing God's song to bless our next generation. Like Paul writes, let's stand firm. And that's our challenge for the week. First, let's ask the Holy Spirit to place onto our heart one person who we need to bless this week. And each day, let's, let's pray a blessing over that person. And if we can, let's send that person a note to encourage and thank her or him for being in our lives. And second, let's bless the person that we don't know by name. It might be that we buy that person's uh, meal or coffee who's behind us in line. It might be taking snacks in the car and giving them out to the homeless that we see. Church, we are blessed to be a blessing. And this week, let's sing that service song loudly. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for this opportunity to gather around your word. You bless us by calling us to be your children you blessed us by giving us a mission to be a blessing to others, to carry your gospel out in word and deed. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities that we have had to do that these past few months in very new, challenging, but inspiring ways. And Lord, this week, today, we commit to more of it. So we pray your blessing over the teachers and the children. We pray your blessing over families and, and every volunteer who, who is willing to impact the next generation in this, in this strange time. We pray your blessing over every household, that it may be a place where you and your love flourish. We pray your blessing over those who feel that they need to riot in order to make their voice heard. We pray your blessing on our leadership. We pray your blessing on the frontline workers. We pray your blessing over military and their family. Lord, as we meet today to, to, to consider an associate pastor, we pray your blessing over that person. We pray your blessing on us as a church to be able to receive that person upon, among us. Lord, we pray your blessing over our nation and all who are in it, whether they are citizens or they are seeking the path, whether they are working with overseas with visas 
or even those, Lord, who are in our land illegally. Lord, they are here for a reason. We pray that you bless them and that we as a church can be a blessing in some way. Lord, you know our prayer requests before we ask. So we simply ask that you unite all our that you would reunite all our prayers into the one prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.